Hi everyone, uh, just um, wanted to make sure that the microphone's working because I've got a new microphone so uh, uh, or using one of my old ones rather than the uh, laptop so uh, just make sure you're there as well if you want to uh, pop a message in the in the chat box just to see who uh, who we've got. Anybody out there? Hey, how you doing, mate? Hi, Cassie. Oh, good. Cool. Good, good. Right then. So we will get going. Thanks, Cassie, for letting us know. Right. Um, so uh, last uh, Monday, seems like a long time ago now with uh, everything that's going on. <laughs> um, so last Monday, we had a look at a, a case, a case history and it was a lady called Liz uh, had a problem with her shoulder. So if you weren't here on Monday, uh, this is me, just in case you've not met me before. My name is Mike, um, the Education Director for Movement Therapy Education and uh, the Clinic Director at Movement Therapy Clinics. We've got a clinic in Birmingham um, and at the moment, as of Friday, we're closed uh, as every single uh, clinic should be and um, uh, hopefully not for not for too long. Uh, we run a multidisciplinary clinic, so everything we teach on the course, we uh, we put into uh, into action. Hi, Polly. Anamir, how are you? Good, good to see you there. And Jess, how are you doing? Uh, Natalie, thank you for your uh, message uh, earlier. It was really good, uh, really good stuff. Um, so a few of you are on the diploma course, which is great. I um, know some of you um, aren't. So some of you will be used to this kind of thing. Some of you won't have done it at all. Uh, just to give you a bit of a background, because um, I've had a couple of messages where people have said, geez, I haven't got a clue. And, uh, and, that, and to be fair, that, that's the point, really, is, uh, is to try to uh, introduce you into the world of uh, what we call OSCEs. So uh, an OSCE is an objective structured clinical exam. And uh, when you do a physio degree or an osteo degree, chiro degree, uh, you tend to have OSCEs as your final year assessment. So the, um, uh, the case history that we've gone through is a final year assessment. So it's meant to be tough. Uh, it's meant to be really tough. And also, don't worry if you think, oh, God, I don't know whether I've got the right answer, because there aren't any. Uh, the whole point of these is just to get you thinking. And uh, there are always lots of things wrong with these people um, because it's uh, it's designed to kind of tease the information out from you to um, uh, look at the way that you think. So what I'm going to do today, I'm going to revisit the case history. And thank you to those that have um, put down some ideas and suggestions what, what might be going on. I'm going to delve into that a little bit more deeply. And I'm going to show you how I structure that information to extract it from the case history. And that this takes years to uh, to um, get good at. It's, uh, it's, it's not something that you pick up overnight. You need to do it again and again. So uh, let's um, just have a bit of a catch up. So we looked at a case history. We picked out some key points. And then hopefully you start to create a sieve. So the idea of a sieve is that you've got loads of information going in. And then you basically sieve it. Um, and sift out all the rubbish, which is trying to lead you down different uh, pathways. And uh, you're trying to identify the key information uh, that is going to really help you and help your patient uh, or your client. So uh, so that that's uh, that's basically what the sieve is trying to do. It's a structured way of sifting through all of the information. Uh, so the plan, uh, obviously, the first session was an introduction to the case. We're going to have a look today at objective assessment planning. So basically, um, from the case history, what the heck do we do now and uh, what things do we need to what things do we need to check? What do we need to test for? So um, this is uh, something from Physiopedia. You, you may again, you may or may not have uh, seen this kind of thing. So apologies if you if you have already. Um, I didn't realize there were so many flags, um, but we basically got taught red and yellow flags. So the orange, the blue and the black for me when I learned all came under yellow. 
And uh, so we're looking for red flags, which are signs of serious pathology with the particular case that we've got uh, with Liz. Uh, we're also looking at yellow flags, so maybe uh, things to do with her um, psychology, so maybe uh, depressive thoughts or personality problems, her beliefs and her judgments, so uh, especially beliefs about pain um, and whether uh, things... Um, uh, she has a, a previous history of, of symptoms that may be contributing to us or current symptoms with, with this particular case, not so much. Um, pain behaviours, perception about relationship between the work and health as well. So uh, th this is um, this, along with the black flags, is, is quite an interesting one. So uh, legislation restriction, uh, restricting options for return to work and uh, conflict with insurance over injury claims. So sometimes um, you will get somebody who um, doesn't like their job and maybe going through an insurance process. So uh, that, that may be an element to their pain is they don't want to get better um, because they, uh, they will lose some kind of um, uh, monetary incentive that, that they have as well. So all of these things we need to, uh, we need to have in the back of our minds. So that's um, just to kind of clarify those flags for you. Uh, so this is the sieve. Uh, we had a look at um, this on the last session. So hopefully you'd have got some things uh, in these boxes now. And I'm going to help you fill this a little bit more today. So today's session literally going to be uh, half an hour tops. So that's it. Just quick. boom, And then um, and then you guys have got some work to do again. And we'll meet up again on Friday. Um, so hopefully you should uh, be aware of uh, of the sieve and uh, what that is. So this is a really important part of uh, the whole screening process and the case history taking process. So on the left hand side, you've got people that come in, they fill in your forms and they say, yep, yeah, I know I've got stuff wrong with me. Here's the list of what's wrong with me. I've had this before. I've got this medical problem. I'm on these drugs and you got a whole list of things and you're like, right, cool. I know what's wrong with you. Um, I may need to get a referral or whatever so I can treat you, but um, we, we know what's wrong and we know what to do. The other part of the problem is uh, people that come in, uh, maybe like Liz, so she's come in and she says, um, my neck hurts um, and she's expecting you to rub it better because that's, that's the kind of thing we do. We give exercises and we do manual therapy, um, but they have no idea that there may be anything wrong. So and this is where things can get a bit dangerous, because if you just look at the musculoskeletal problems that they are presenting, then you may miss out some um, pathology uh, that could be contributing towards her symptoms. So this is what we're dealing with within these uh, case scenarios. OK, so that that's uh, that's really important to um, to understand. So uh, things that people know they've got. And then sometimes they don't even know that they've got a problem and it's our job to try and sift through all the information to see if there is something that's uh, that's causing the problem. So this is Liz. Um, this was the um, scenario that we did on Monday. So what I've done, I've just underlined some key information here. Um, so uh, when we had these as exams, when I was going through my final year exams, we would get this written out on a piece of paper and then I get a highlighter pen and I just highlight all the key information um, so that I could start to order my thoughts and, and, and prioritize what I was going to look at or whether this person needed to go to hospital straight away or whether it was something I, that I could deal with. So um, uh, this is, uh, hi Kay, welcome. Um, so these are the kind of things that I uh, have highlighted for this case. So we've got someone who's 67 years old immediately the age of someone will predispose them to certain conditions and a few of you have picked up on the fact that um, she may be at risk of osteoporosis um, with the uh, chat on the Facebook page so that was really good um, and uh, there's some other things in her history as well that uh, may lead her down that pathway so that's a, a good thought process. Um, she's worked in fashion and marketing most of her life and we know that um, that kind of industry i mean we're being very judgmental and stereotypical here but uh, that kind of injury is very um, injury that that kind of uh, industry is very fast paced uh, a lot of late nights a lot of uh, um, entertaining clients like she's been doing um, but she's 67 years old and she's still doing it and still traveling all over the place um 
we've got five foot seven and 10 stone. And if you check the BMI of that, then that's within the healthy range. But that's something that you always need to do. Uh, so make, making sure that the person isn't um, underweight or um, overweight or obese or, what, or whatever. Um, so al always take that into consideration and have the charts there just in case uh, so that you can quickly, um, quickly have a look at those. So she looks a little anxious and she had trouble rising from the chair. So immediately you're kind of thinking, OK, this may be some kind of musculoskeletal problem, maybe to do with the back or a hips. And we're, we're at this point, we haven't um, talked to her. Uh, she's very stressed. OK, so uh, that this can be. Um, uh, that this can raise sensitivity levels so you can have increased pain uh, when you're highly stressed and uh, there's really good evidence um, for that we don't really know how emotion and pain are linked um, but we know that they are uh, we don't really understand the mechanisms of it but we know that as you uh, if you are quite stressed then you tend to feel uh, symptoms more um, uh, intensely uh, the, this is key information here. So she's been forgetting appointments and incorrectly completing orders lately, and she feels very tired. So these are key things that we need to have a look at a little bit later on. Uh, so moving on through. So she's come to you with neck pain. So her neck hurts, her traps her. She's come in and that kind of typical person where she just wants to have her neck rubbed. And um, and then uh, that that will make it feel better. That might be the thing that's going on in her mind. Um, but we obviously need to delve a little bit deeper than, than that and see if there's anything else uh, going on with her as well. So a lot of you picked up on the fact that um, we've got the symptoms going up into her neck. So that could be some kind of trapezius related pain or levator scapula um, uh, symptoms there. But it's associated with tingling into all of the fingers of the right hand. Uh, and quite a few of you picked up on this. So um, some of you said Raynard's. Uh, some of you were saying uh, something called thoracic outlet syndrome. And then uh, on the chat for the last time, we were talking about a possible radiculopathy as well. So some kind of um, brachial plexus compression, maybe at the nerve root or, or somewhere along that line, uh, which is really good thinking. So what you then have to do uh, with that information I mean, obviously, we don't have Liz here to uh, to question her, but we would delve into that a little bit more. So it's in the whole hand. Is it in the other hand as well? Because if it was something like Raynard's, then usually it would be in both hands and it may affect the feet as well. So it's it's a bit more systemic um, and in uh, in multiple areas rather than just the one. You can um, get it more in one side than the other, um, but it's um, it, it's more likely that it would be in, in both hands. And then if it was a nerve issue, then it would usually affect different um, parts of the hand. So the median nerve are those three, so forming an M. And then the ulnar nerve is those two, forming a U. So you've got median and then ulnar. So if it was your median nerve, then it may be these three fingers. And then ulnar nerve, these, these two. So if you're thinking that it's a radiculopathy from the neck, then you would expect it to either be in those two or those three. If it's the whole hand, it could be both nerves. Of the whole hand. So that's why I think some of you put Reynards. Um, so again, a good shout. That's that's something to consider. Um, but again, we've got um, some other reasons as well why why you might um, have a cold feeling in the in the whole hand. Um, a bit of a kind of um, bit of a red herring, really. But um, well, not a red herring, but to throw you off the scent of the shoulder, um, they've put in as well about a right sided groin ache, too. So then that's that links us to a completely different part of the body. And you think, well, are these two related or are they two completely separate things? Did they start at the same time or were they? So it get you, it, and that's the whole point of these, they get you thinking about um, all the possibilities. So um, this has been present intermittently for the last couple of weeks. Um, so this hasn't been going on uh, for as long as the uh, shoulder. Um, but this this is the strange thing. So if someone comes in with shoulder pain or, or a problem with their shoulder joint, you would expect there to be restriction in the shoulder. Yeah, but there's no restriction. So, so the likelihood of it being a musculoskeletal problem then goes down your list, goes down the order. Um, because she can move her shoulder fine, but it hurts. Uh, 
that should be getting your thought processes going, well, uh, what else could be causing this? There must be something else that's causing this shoulder. Patient wants uh, who um, could move his shoulder absolutely fine, no problems at all, um, had pain in the shoulder and um, it did, just didn't seem right and um, he had lung cancer. And the lung cancer was referring into the shoulder and um, and that was what um, and it was the the um, the cancer that was pressing on something in his abdomen that was then causing the problems with his shoulder. So his shoulder, there was nothing wrong with it. it we did all the power tests, all the strength tests, all the range of movement tests, and they were all negative. Uh, and that should raise some suspicions in your mind that it isn't the shoulder that's the problem. There's got to be something else. Okay. So what we're going to have a look at now is a little bit of anatomy. So I'm just going to um, have a look at this. So hopefully you can see this screen. Uh, this is a really good, um, a really good app called the uh, Complete Anatomy. So you can add uh, layers of all, all sorts of different things. So at the moment, we've got a few layers of muscle um, on there as well. And we can add some more on there. So we, we've got pain around this area here. So if I just spin that around there, so um, trapezius area around the kind of platysma um, sort of region, but mainly around here, really, that's where they were complaining of it. So if we then um, just start to take a few muscle layers off, we can then delve into the anatomy of this area. So if we just zoom in here a sec. Now, I've deliberately kept this in. Okay, so one of the things that runs around this area, and a few of you picked up on this, um, this is your um, artery that goes down your arm. So around about here, it's called the subclavian artery because it goes underneath the clavicle. Um, and it comes out between these muscles here. So these are your scalene muscles in your neck. And a few, a few people mentioned that um, with the... Um, uh, with the suggestions that they put down. So that was really good. So this is one of the possible um, causes of your hand going completely numb. Um, and especially if it's the whole hand, because if you have a blockage of the blood supply here, whether it's on the collarbone, uh, whether it's because it's the neck muscles or whether it's underneath this muscle here, uh, which is your pec minor muscle, then um, that can occlude that artery and then your hand goes numb and it feels cold so it could be the nerves as well so if we just put in uh, the nerves in there so we've got all the nerves coming in around there too so this area is called a neurovascular bundle so we've got the nerves and the blood supply all coming through that area there and it runs um, all the way down the arm okay and then obviously we'll supply then the uh, the hand so that could be one of the main reasons why our lady has got numb fingers so if i just take all the muscles away so there we go there so you can see exactly where the where the blood supply goes through okay just underneath that collarbone there and then uh, underneath the pec minor and then down the uh, down the inside of the arm so uh, if it was, uh, like I say, if it was one of the nerves, then it would usually just affect parts of the hands. But if it's the blood supply, then it will affect the whole hand. So that's uh, something to something to think about there. OK, so hopefully that makes um, a bit more a bit more sense if you've not heard of it before. And that's called thoracic outlet syndrome. So uh, this um, the area where the blood supply comes out is the is the thoracic outlet. And, uh, and there are various different um, thoracic outlets that you can get. You can get a vascular one, so to do with the blood supply. You can get a, neuro, um, a neurological, neurogenic um, thoracic, out, uh, thoracic outlet as well. You can also have a, an additional rib. So usually we've got 12 ribs and they start at the thoracic vertebra. But sometimes people have a rib on their C7 so they have an additional rib right at the top, and then that can press into the neurovascular bundle and cause uh, thoracic outlet syndrome as well. So a couple of different reasons why, uh, why this person might have um, some, uh, some issues. So if I just go back to the slides again. Um, so this was the, uh, this was the onset. Um, so the shoulder and neck has been a feature for two months. 
And again, this is a bit of a red flag that happened for no apparent reason. So if you've got someone who's coming to you with pain, usually they've done something, usually they've fallen um, and uh, or they've uh, picked something up and it was really heavy. But this has happened for no reason at all. So that that's a bit strange. If it was a musculoskeletal issue, then usually there's a reason for it. And uh, and there's something that's uh, something that's happened there. Uh, a few of you picked this up as well. So the groin ache seems to start with the gradual onset. Um, a lot of traveling, uh, sitting on the train, so that was good. Uh, a few people mentioned uh, hip flexor problems. Um, I th I'm not sure if someone mentioned hernia as well. So um, some uh, good suggestions coming through there. Uh, the groin symptoms are worse following rest. Um, that's a bit weird if it was a muscle. So usually muscles, when you work them they, they and they're injured, they feel worse. So it's uh, again, it's strange that the groin symptoms are worse when you're resting. Uh, and then we've got this early morning stiffness for an hour. And I think um, I think, again, a couple of you were talking about um, a hip pathology, maybe um, osteoporosis or, um, uh, or osteoarthritic hip. And she fits the age profile uh, and um, and other things in her history as well may, may link to her bone health not being so great either. Um, shoulder pain is worse in the evening. Okay, so that's getting worse throughout the throughout the day, um, and the hand tingling gets worse with activity. So when you use your hand, you need a blood supply, and if your blood supply is affected, then your hand will get worse when you're trying to use it. So again, we've got another thing that's pointing towards that uh, thoracic outlet um, in the uh, in the shoulder, or, or it, it, definitely part of the mix anyway so aggravating factors uh, walking was becoming more difficult and again if you've got a blood supply issue or maybe some kind of um, uh, cardiovascular problem then it's going to be difficult to walk but then that's the same if you've got a musculoskeletal problem as well um, but and uh, the walking causes pain more pain for both complaints so the one thing that links the two again is is the blood supply. So um, uh, we're we're starting to pick up a, a, a couple of issues here where there may be something seriously wrong with this uh, with this lady. We need to refer her to someone else. Um, and then just to kind of throw you off on on another tangent, we've got neck extension um, produces a sudden sharp lower neck pain. So again, that might be linked in um, to um, the osteoporotic risk. Yeah, and a few of you picked up on that as well. So that was really good. Um, yeah, um, so the bending forward um, helps. Um, again, that could be taking some pressure off of the hip. So um, again, that pointing towards that osteoarthritic hip. And that, but again, this is another red flag here. There are no relieving factors for the shoulder pain. It doesn't matter what she does, what position she gets in, um, what, uh, how she holds her arm, she just can't get comfortable. And, that, and that's a bit of a strange one. Um, another red flag, it's gradually worsening over time. So things that are musculoskeletal usually um, sort themselves out in about six weeks, even if you just left them alone. So the fact that it's getting worse and worse over time is another uh, red flag. We've also got another cardiovascular issue here with the blood pressure um, being so high too. So we've got a number of things, again, talking about our cardiovascular health. And then one of the big things here, living on aspirin. And uh, a few of you picked this up that um, there are uh, people who take a lot of aspirin because obviously it thins the blood. So they're more likely to bleed. They're more likely to have gastrointestinal bleeding and um, uh, more likely to suffer from strokes. So, and, and if you remember right back at the beginning, she was becoming forgetful. So maybe there's something linked in there as well with some kind of um, hemorrhage. Okay, so uh, again, something really quite nasty. So uh, we, need to, um, we need to be aware, just have that in, a, in the back of our minds. Um, respiratory wise, she's a little breathless um, and she's got this bilateral swelling of the ankles. So um, usually if you have swelling in one ankle, is because you've gone over on your ankle. If you've got swelling in both ankles, it's because there is a problem with your blood supply um, or some kind of systemic uh, pathology. So having swelling on both sides is usually indicative that there's something um, not quite right and uh, it needs to be checked out. Um, again, none of this will be able to give any kind of um, 
put your hat on it diagnosis there's too many things going on with this case to say she has this again it's just to get you thinking about what what could possibly be going on um so we've got the right hand again uh we've got mentioned about men mental agility is deteriorated so again maybe something affecting her brain um gynecological problems a few of you picked up on this as well about having um uh, problems because of the post-surgery scars uh, with the hysterectomy um, but also that she's had no HRT as well so that puts her at an increased risk of osteoporotic fractures so again that's kind of tying into some of the other stuff so oh, it's more likely to be that and then you get another bit of information and then that overtakes it you think oh okay it might be this so it's always in your mind things are going right it could be that it could be that but you've uh, you, you've got to try and um, uh, prioritize things when you've got someone in front of you so gastrointestinal wise um the right side upper quadrant um, there's pain there and she um is getting bloating uh, and she's getting pain, especially after food. So if we have a look back at our anatomy model again, um, in that upper right quadrant, just zoom out there, we have this, uh, just get rid of those. You have your liver, okay? And a couple of you mentioned as well that the liver and the gallbladder, if you have um, a problem with the liver, it refers to your shoulder, okay? So if you have a liver problem, it can present as shoulder pain. So uh, there, um, in fact, what I'll do, because um, this will be really good for you to research, I, I want you to find out why. Why do you get... Okay, so that's uh, shoulder pain with some a problem with the liver or for you guys to to have the gallbladder what what's the mechanism of okay have a look at okay so a uh, bit of bit of just go back onto this give me a second this okay let me just the um so slides that aren't working let's just go to this <laughs> okay so I'll just share this one with you Hopefully, we'll get the picture soon. Here we go. Right, okay. So, uh, just enlarge that so you can see it. Bear with me a sec. Okay, right then. So, hey, I'll, what I'll do, I'll post up the, um, uh, the PowerPoint slide so you can see it uh, in a bit more detail. Let me just zoom in here a bit so you can see. So when you've got all that information, this is the kind of thing that I, I would do. So I'd put my clinical impression down this side. OK, so we've got thoracic outlet there. We've got a hip or shoulder pathology. Uh, we've got um, liver gallbladder pathology. We've got possible hernia, so on and so on. So you list all the things that could possibly uh, be the reason why this uh, person has got these symptoms. Then you put why. So you put your justification in here. So why do we think it's thoracic outlet? Well, she's got tingling in the whole hand. Why do we think it's a shoulder pathology? Because of the location of the symptoms. Why do we think it's a liver problem? Because she's got shoulder pain, there's no restriction, she's tired, there's memory loss, confusion. So that there's quite a few things that are pointing towards this liver problem, okay? So um, this, is, this is how I would lay it out. You don't have to uh, do it this way, but this is what I would do. And then what you would do okay, what's the next step? So if there is tingling in the whole hand and we think it might be thoracic outlet, what do we do? Are there any tests that we can do? Are there any orthopedic tests? Um, are there any, um, uh, yeah, are there any um, 
uh, investigations that we need to send them for? Do we need to send them to A and E? Do we need to? Uh, can we treat them? Um, do we need to send them to the GP? So they're uh, that, uh, that that it could be. Um, Natalie, just seen your message there. Um, and do you know which bit that you wanted me? Um, so that's your task um, for Friday. Okay, so we've got a list of um, we've got a list of potential pathologies, and by no means is this an exhaustive list. Okay, um, there could be a hundred different things that that we found uh, wrong with this woman. Um, these are the reasons why. So I've had to justify why I've said these things here, and then the next thing is what would you do next? Okay, so for Friday, what I'd like you to do is create your own list your own justifications. And then if you do some, uh, okay, I'll tell you what we do, Natalie. We'll, um, uh, if you send me a message offline and then we'll cover that offline for you. Okay, just so I can make sure I know exactly what you're after. So um, uh, yeah, next step for you guys is to, is to work out the test that you could do and you might need to do a bit of research on it. So some of them you might know, okay? So if it's a hip or shoulder exam, um, you should know how to do those if, you, if you've been doing this before. Um, if you're brand new to it, then you obviously wouldn't have a clue, um, but it's a good way to, uh, to find out what to do. Uh, and um, yeah, let's fill in this uh, right-hand side, okay? So see if you can get any more uh, pathologies as well. So see if there's anything else that you can uh, come up with. And then uh, let's fill in this uh, this right hand side so that we've got a list of tests uh, that we uh, that we can do for Liz. Okay, so that's it for today. Okay, summary of the um, uh, of the case, a breakdown of how to sift through the sieve and pick out the key information, uh, and then what do you do with that key information? What does it mean? What could it potentially mean? And then what do you do about it? And now I completely understand that if this is new to you you don't know what you don't know, okay? So there'll be some things on my list We're still there. Sorry about that. So yeah, there'll be uh, things on my list where um, uh, you might have not even thought about it. So uh, which is fine. That's exactly what we're here for. Uh, just sharing ideas. So um, what um, uh, I'll do, I'll post uh, this video online so that you've got access to it. And then if you can put your test ideas, what you want to do next with Liz, and then we'll have a discussion about that on Friday. And uh, we'll have a look at some of the tests that I would do um, if some of the other things were, weren't there, because obviously she's got some serious things wrong with her. So, uh, yeah, um, we'll create a plan and um, we'll come back Friday, six o'clock. See you then.